You have to answer the questions, Christian. That's, that's just how it works. <laughs> you give it a shot. You give it a shot. You probably do fine. Probably better than I have fun. No problem. <clears throat> right. Well, we're getting ready to kick off the final session, as it were. We're done eating some pizza and stuff, and uh, now we're going to kick into just a short question and answer time. Well, short or long, however long people ask, and uh, we'll see if uh, I may. Who could I get? Who would be willing? Who's a who? Who would be willing to stand over here? I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up to people that if anybody that turns in watching online would like to ask a question on here live. Turn it. Thanks, Jake. You just watch and I'll turn it around. But then oh. when you see a question come up, if they ask a question, just shoot it at us at the table. Shoot it at you. You know, just tell me. You know. Just tell you. you understand? So I can sit down. Or yeah. Do you well, I just need to. You can sit here. I just need. To, you need to kind of somebody watch the camera to see if the question comes up. That would be it. Or you can follow the stream on your own phone and tell us if you want to do it. You can do that if you like and sit at your own desk, whatever you like to do. As long as you can follow me on Facebook. But you just want me to, like, signal Yeah, I mean, we'll ask questions. You say it? Well, yeah. Do you want me to read it off? Yeah, if you could, because I'll be over there answering my phone's up here. But, yeah. So, folks, so that's what it is right now. And if anybody's on Facebook and wants to and is connected to me on mine, feel free to share it. But for those of you who are watching, we're doing our SOEC question and answer. We're going to kick off here real quick. So we have someone manning this uh, stream, too. So if you have a question for us live, feel free to ask the question, and we will try to answer it from the field. We're going to be answering questions of people here, but also your questions online. So if you have questions of anything... Feel free to shoot us the question. We'll try to answer it. Um, none of us are claiming to be in-depth theologians, so you may stump the chump up here. Who knows? But uh, feel free to throw it out there. We'll see what we can find an answer to. And also, we're kind of like, uh, think of it as a, a low-budget Bible answer man, but we haven't uh, we haven't gone off the rails into uh, the things that Hank Hanegraaff is, so maybe we're better off anyway. But if you have any questions... Feel free to shoot them. It doesn't have to be evangelism related as long as it's Bible related. Um, we'll try to answer it. I don't know much good sports trivia, so I can't answer many of those anymore. So um, Bible stuff, but especially evangelism, give it a shot. Shoot the question onto the stream, and someone will ask us your question as it comes in to the flow. So anyway, let me turn it around, give a little bit of introductions to the folks. I didn't want that. There we go. Don't want to cancel it. I want to finish the thing. All right, so we've got over here to the far right, if you've been watching the conference, far my right, my right over my arm, that's the bald guy over there. That makes it easy to say. The bald guy over there, that's Ryan Clark. <clears throat> Ryan's been kind of heading up a lot of the uh, activity down here for uh, RV Salt Shakers and uh, Southern Oregon, uh, the Abolition Society of Southern Oregon, right? ASSO. And he's been kind of spearheading a lot of the talks with the city council, with gathering up pastors, getting people involved, getting people plugged into being outside Planned Parenthood, just leading up a whole lot of stuff, kind of spearheading the charge down here in, in Southern Oregon. So that's Ryan Clark. The empty chair there is me talking over here. So that's Mason Goodnight. And uh, you don't need to know anything about me. Don't worry about it. Just ask questions. I might be able to answer at some point here. And then next to him is John Clement. And John is the, what are you, president, founder, what do we, what do we call you of RV Salt Shakers? Founder of, of <laughs> RV Salt Shakers. The floundering founder. That's John Clement. John's been, John has been leading up RV Salt Shakers, the evangelism ministry down here, what, about 10 years now or so? Or 12 years now. So he's been going at it for a dozen years down here with uh, RV Salt Shakers. And so if you've ever been anywhere in Southern Oregon at a festival and you've seen a, and you've seen a booth or two booth wide with a bunch of Jesus stuff all over it, you've probably run into John Clement in the RV Salt Shakers booth and asking you good question, good person test questions and all kinds of stuff. So especially if you have a way of the master themed question here tonight, you know, John's going to be the guy you're going to have the answer on that. Law gospel stuff, excellent there. Mark Mayberry over here to the far left. Mark has been, I, I would say, in this game longer than any of us. He does, we don't really w put his years in years, more like decades, he's been in the fight for the gospel on the streets from Portland down here to uh, southern Oregon, and the, especially the Riddle area now. And Mark's been like his total mentor to me in street evangelism, pointed 
to him by Bible Jim Weber, and uh, he's been integral into me getting into street evangelism and a lot of people doing anything. So if I've influenced anybody positively in evangelism, it's because Mark's influenced me positively in evangelism, and especially also now abolitionism. So Mark and the Mayberry family are the are the folks who brought abolitionism to Douglas County, um, and we'll be talking about that too. So if you're sitting here going, I don't even know what abolitionism is. I didn't listen to Ryan's last uh, message, or you're actually clueless about that. That's a good question to ask. We'll be happy to answer it. So here we go. Anybody fire any questions? Of course, people in the crowd, I'm going to go sit over there, and uh, we'll see what happens. So here we go. That's enough intro to give people time to figure out a question. So my question is, and this has been on my mind for a few weeks, well, probably a long time, and I think Pastor Chuck talked about it. My question is, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will get saved. Do we believe that? Because I've talked to people over the years who said, I've asked God to save me, I've begged him to save me, and they don't get saved. So there's that. And then uh, God does the work of saving. I, my concern is on the street, sometimes I wonder if we leave the impression that all those people have to do is decide to follow Jesus, and they will be saved. Sure. There you go. Okay, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take just a piece of it, the everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. And most recently I've listened to a, to a great uh, message from Paul Washer on this, and so I'll just kind of use his, his imagery. That that's not a cheap little American, I'm going to cry out to Jesus and want to be saved. Um, the, the, the imagery is the Roman guards with the altar, Caesar, you know, call, you know, Sprinkle incense, call upon Caesar, or call upon the name of the Lord and be killed. And so um, it's, it's why, it's connected to the second part of the question, it's why we don't fish for decisions when we're out there. And it, it, it feels weird, and we get this question even in church, we, you know, we're, we're, we're preaching and we're done, and we don't do the altar call, we don't, you know, you need to believe in Jesus today, you know, you need to make a decision right now, it's um, when someone's saved, they're gonna be, they're gonna be saved. Like when someone's life is transferred from death to life, that renewal or regeneration is going to happen. They're gonna be, uh, I believe, and they're gonna know yeah. rather than for us fishing for it. I and, believe that. I just think I wonder if we're giving the perception to oh. the public that oh, all we have to do is wake up one morning and decide to follow Jesus. Yeah, you know, it doesn't. I know it doesn't work like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, I do think. It, it probably would behoove us to spend a little time when we say everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord as part of our preaching to, to, to clarify the cost of what we mean. I know we do that in individual conversations whenever we have follow-ups with people, but but um but, I know whether you yeah. do that or not, God can save or not save somebody. Sure. I get, I get sure, that, yeah. So. I don't know if anybody else I would only add to that when we look at scripture too, we have to always remember, and that is a call, that is a speaking to the lost. That is a reaching out to the lost question in our scripture, we always have to remember who the audience is being talked to in the scripture. And we always have to remember that too and how we minister to, how we use certain scriptures. And because of ambiguity and possibility of something like that, like Ryan made it very clear, and without a historical, I never even had heard that before about I knew about the picture, but I never heard of it in that connotation myself. Um, and when we were talking about calling on the Lord, it's, I would say, and I think correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the calling on the name of the Lord is the same, it's synonymous with trust in the Lord, you know, you're placing your trust in Him, you're calling on Him because you trust that He is saving you, it's not like a, I called on Him and see if it was real, like I, I wanted to be saved from this mess, and they usually have this horizontal focus I, I've dealt with that a lot in, with a lot of folks I've dealt with especially in my job, a lot of people want out of their mess so they call on Jesus to fix their mess here. They don't really care about their vertical relationship with God. They're not trusting in him to save them from their sins. And so when I preach generally, I don't usually use that. I'm not saying I've never used that. But usually I call and use, this, use the term Jesus out of John 6 when he says, come to me. Come. Come to Christ. And I will never, he will never turn away anyone who comes to him. But coming, in, it, it speaks of what has to happen. You've been going a different direction now. Turn, come to me. It means you have to come. You, it's, that's what repentance kind of comes into the 
coming to Christ. So I, I, use, I wouldn't use that term as much because of possible ambiguity, but there's nothing wrong with it. Again, it's the Word of God, like you said. Yeah, okay. so and on a practical note, when we've been at this specifically like a, like a pride festival, when there's hundreds of people boasting in pride in front of us, and there's been a time or two where I've used that phrase, and there was nothing easy believism about it. It was not perceived in the, in the power of the Spirit. They knew very clearly they hated Jesus. And it wasn't like, oh, I just have to call. And I mean, they'll mock that way. Oh, so you can say I can do whatever I want and just be saved. I mean, but they're not even really, they're not taken very seriously. I, um, in, at least in that setting, when, we've, when I've said a phrase like that, it's, I think it's been taken more, the Spirit is used to more the way the Bible would, would say. But I do think being aware is important. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I would just uh, add that, that in the scripture, there's many times where it says, like the Philippian jailer, that uh, when he said, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul says, well, believe in Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, you'll be saved, you and your household. And uh, then you see other times in the scripture where Paul talked about where you needed to bear fruits to, of repentance. And uh, same thing with Peter. You look at the first part of the book of Acts where Peter preaches his gospel message. He didn't tell people to believe. He told them to repent. And so in the scripture, you, you have to take in context of the New Testament what it means to believe, what it means to repent, what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. And so when you take these isolated incidents, whether it be called upon the Lord or coming to Christ or receive Christ, um, we have to look at the definitions from the biblical perspective of what it means to truly believe. And as Maiden said, we have to come to a place where a person trusts in the Lord. Where they don't trust in their own righteousness, they're going to be accepted because of how good they are and how they try to keep the commandments of God. No, it first has to see that, that they, have, where they trust in Christ because they recognize they can't trust in themselves. They need a Savior. And they're not trusting just in like... Today, when I was at the farmer's market, when I preached about repentance and faith, I tried to explain things as clearly as possible so that when people hear the message, they understand their accountability, that they're not just getting a false message and responding to a false message. Oh, that's easy. I can be saved if I, if I just say a prayer like, uh, like what, what uh, Mesa was talking about. I mean, uh, excuse me, Ryan. We don't, we don't give an altar call and say, if you come up here and say the sinner's prayer, you're saved, or if you get baptized and join the church, whatever, that you, you, you've got an in with God and you've got eternal life as fire insurance for your soul. No, it's between you and God that you have to come to meet Him on His terms. And His terms in the scripture is repent and believe. And we have to explain what it means to repent. Repent means simply uh, not only a change of mind, the Greek word, uh, I can met I can't remember yeah. off the top of my head. I forget so much. But anyway, it means a change of mind that leads to change of behavior and how you live. That you turn from living for yourself and sin and the things of this world to you turn to Christ and you want to trust in Him and live for His kingdom. So this that you become a new creature in Christ, like Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter five, where old things pass away and all things become new. And so just that's that's the foundation there is where God comes in. You become born again by the Spirit of God. And He changes you. And salvation comes to a person. And you know it because God's Spirit lives in your heart. And He's transformed your life to where He gives you a new heart. He takes out the heart of flesh. I mean, the heart of stone. and gives you a heart of flesh, desire for Him and His kingdom. And so when people say, well, all you got to do is believe in Jesus. Or all you got to do is this or whatever. That that we have to understand what God's terms are. Sure. And that's really the important thing. And I think the, all those terms have been watered down. Like a lot of gospel tracts don't even have repentance in it. They don't talk about this thing. They don't talk about the reality of what it means to, to follow Christ. That's why today I preached uh, about what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? What it means, like me said, what it means to come to Christ. It means to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Six times Jesus said that in the Gospels, the multitudes. Six times. Over 15 times he called them to follow him. And he wasn't easy with it. He actually told people, you know, like one guy says, hey, you know, hey, I gotta go bury my father. I gotta take care of stuff first. He said, no. If you're looking back and stuff like that, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. 
You know, allow the dead to bury their own dead. You get right with me and you follow me right now. And and that's the issue is, is that people have an opportunity. But that doesn't just mean always. It just means when God is calling you and he's working on your heart, you need to respond. And I, I'm probably going to more of it. You're a preacher. You got to preach. You got to preach. Do you want to stick stab anything? I don't know. Yeah, we covered it really well. I guess it's just it's that thing of getting the cart before the horse, which our modern evangelism, yeah. evangelistic churches have done. Say this prayer and you'll be saved. Uh, but it's, a, it's an outflowing from the heart. You've heard the law and gospel, and it's broken. You've got to be broken. And that when I, I hear of true, true repentance, where you see fruit, I'm talking about, I'm talking about fruit. You mentioned that too, but uh, seeing actual fruit come out of it, that you, you've got a sincere, repentant heart. When we speak of God's promises, He promises to save. I mean, I think this yeah. was said today. Yeah. He promised, if you call on His name, He promises to save. Right. And yeah. I just don't know about that. You know? Sure. Well, and I would say, again, like, like He was saying, like was, when you're calling, it's the idea of, like I said, it's calling, trusting that He will save. And I think maybe we should even use a picture of. You're in the burning building and you're calling the fireman, please save me, and you he will. And it's that kind of calling. It's not a calling, well, I tried, you know, I tried. I threw it up the prayer and I've called a hundred times and Jesus is never and I've never felt any different. It's this Americanized, flippant, you know, I've called, I, I've been in these tough places and God's never answered my prayer. And if you dig into it, you'll probably find it something in that realm. But when you call, it's like explaining, when you're talking about calling to be saved, how would you call? on someone if you were in a burning building or you were drowning and you were going to die how would your call be that's what you call it Christ. when you're desperate you know i'm going to die i'm a sinner i deserve i could fall into hell today and you know that jonathan edwards sinner in the hands of an angry god reality hits your soul and you're like oh jesus save me and he says yes i will save the person who calls on me like that that's the calling it is a day well i tried and he didn't answer and i think that's what we get with a lot of flippant stuff yeah. like that so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Christopher Wright, we asked, Hey, brothers, so I know some of you hold to presuppositional, yep. some hold to evidential, some are Arminianism, Arminianism and Calvinism, or provisional, etc. He's what? going deep on one question. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What yeah. unites you as one organism to be used of God? Because I know some of you believe that people can respond by free will. Some others believe that they can respond only because of limited atonement, essentially. So how do you get around that in practical ways as your orthopraxy? Orthopraxy. Well, let me stab at it first because I won when I spoke first. And it's my camera. Let me, and just so any, because I know the question will come up there because we're so similar that even Mark screwed up who we were. Just so you know, we, we are not twins, but I mean, but Mason, Mason all Clark, of, over here. yeah, Mason Clark, Ryan Goodnight, we get, we are mixed up in newspapers. There's all kinds of things going on with us here. We're not actually related, but we are one as brothers in Christ. Um, up on this table, I think it's safe to say that um, one, two, three, we're reformed, soteriologically Calvinistic. Mark is not. Um, so that would be, there would be the division, as there were. Why can we all agree? Because the gospel and dealing with the salvation of a sinner, while Calvinism and is a great thing to debate over, and I think it's very important, I love to have those talks. And I'm I'm positive I'm right, so I mean I love to have this talk. But I mean, and I agree with him. So. There we are. So, I mean, but but the thing is, is that it's like one young man said once: the difference between say why a Calvinist and an Arminian, or and some people don't even like to use the terms. So whatever people that you know, monergist, synergist, whatever terms you want to use, um, why we can do that? One young man said the, the big key is someone asked him, well, why do you think it's not such a huge deal for? A Calvinist and Arminian to, Arminian to work together versus someone who is a um, open theist um, or maybe like an open theist, which is a popular, sadly growing popular idea that you know, for those who don't know, open theist is someone who says God doesn't know everything. He's he's without omniscience, and that is a and it's in street preaching, but it's out there. And this young man answered quite clearly, quite well. He says because the difference between a Calvinist and Arminian is about how God works, how God uses his power, and an open theist is about who God is. One affects the way you think God works, the other affects who he is as, a, as God. And that's a huge difference in how you're dealing with them. 
when we're talking about the, the difference between, and I called this the dividing line, I did a whole thing on it. It's very simple. It's a, there's a distinct dividing line that you will know. If, you've, if you're in, anybody's watching this and you're wondering, because the famous thing said by most people that are into free will, it's they're just saying, well, I'm neither a Calvinist nor an Arminian. I, I'm neither. I just believe the Bible. You, know, you hear that thing. Well, the way you know is that you either believe one of two things. I can say this lying on the table. You either believe that someone preaches the gospel to you, you repent, you believe, you're born again, and that's when you're saved. That is the synergist free will position. You hear the gospel, you repent, you believe, you're born again, and then you're saved. On the Calvinist side, the monergist position is you're born again, therefore you repent, believe, and are saved. It's completely opposite, and that dividing line is the complete difference. There's, there's no way it can be, no one can be neither or both. You fall on one side of that line or the other. You either believe you're born again, and because you're born again, you're enabled to believe and place your faith in Christ and repent, or you believe you freely choose to repent, believe, and therefore are then born again. And that's a big debate. But why can we work together? Because when does that come up in a conversation with someone on the street that it matters? It might, but let's be honest. Mark will call people, uh, Ryan, myself, John, we'll all call people, what will we say? Come to Christ. <clears throat> like I was just saying, I say, come to Christ, repent, and believe the gospel. That's the same call. The only difference is on us in a street preaching thing, in which most people don't even notice, I would say, and even, I think even some Calvinists grind my gears when I hear it sometimes. Like Mark, when Mark's preaching, you'll hear him say, Jesus died for all of our sins. Jesus died for your sins. And I won't say that because I believe in limited atonement and I believe that it's only the elect who died for their sins. So what I'll say is Jesus died for sinners. Now why, to the people that are out there, and I'm saying everybody's falling short of the glory of God and they're sinners, what does that affect the message being preached to them? What in that way makes any, it doesn't ever make Mark upset that I'd say that. No one gets bent out of shape. And we're on these things because we're preaching that you are lost, your only hope is Christ, and you need to come to him. And it makes no difference in the eternal workings like Merrick was teaching today on the things of heaven, the things that are going on above the sun and in the heavenly realm. <clears throat> like Spurgeon said, until God paints a green stripe down the back of the elect, you know, I'm going to keep just <laughs> preaching the gospel to repent and believe in Christ. And if he does that, then I'll start lifting up shirt tails and looking for the next right. But until then, I'm just going to preach the gospel and tell people to repent and believe. And I think, Mark, we're calling people to Christ. That's why we work together, because we all realize we're sinners. And Mark would agree. And unless you're a Pelagian, which is a rare and sadly growing thing, and he's not, he doesn't deny, and any Orthodox Christian does not deny that a work of the Spirit must be done in the life of a believer prior to them coming to Christ. So there's a work, there's a preemptive, prevenient work of grace happening in the Spirit where each of us going out trusting in Christ to save that sinner. And we call it because we know we believe in the same Jesus, we believe in the same God, we just have a difference in opinion of how he brings that person to faith. And I will admit there are some people, maybe in some people watching, that say we, that, that even Calvinistic stance of mind, that I'm a softy and a, I'm on the verge of heresy if not, because I'm not saying that his even believing that way is heresy. So it's very so far, but I think everybody at this table would agree. You're a big softy. Yeah, big softy. You're a big softy. Yeah, I try. Yeah, because, you know, uh, I agree with what Mason's saying as far as the differences and stuff. And, and, and basically, if you hear, like Mason's saying, when we hear him preach, people out there, when he says all are sinners, Christ died for sinners, the people out there are going to believe the same things if I said Jesus if I quote John 3.16, for God's love the world, gave his only begotten son. Well, how did he give? He died on the cross for our sins. So we're both saying the same thing, but we both mean something different. But what does the audience say? They say the same thing, using different languages. They don't know our theology behind it. But our goal is still the same. They must repent. They must believe. They must be saved. They must, and it must happen because God does it. And it must be evidence that they are born again of the Spirit of God. Okay, we both agree. There's no denying that. And when he says uh, limited atonement, I believe in. Uh, I wouldn't say universal atonement, but I believe in that atonement is 
provided for all people, even though people don't all receive it. But it still ends up the same thing. If you believe the limited atonement, or you believe that God's a provisional atonement that's provided for all people, it only applies to the limited ones who do repent and believe. It's always limited somehow. It's all limited it's not. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's true. I can say that, maybe softy. But, but you understand what I'm saying, though, is that words can, uh, can give the same impression even though we have different meanings behind what we're saying, but our goal is still the same. And that's the that's important thing. And Mark and I are so close. Mark's probably read more Reformers than I have. Because again, he's a little bit older than I am. He's read a lot of great guys. <laughs> and, I, and I read and uh, appreciate a lot of non reform guys. And we, we have these different opinions. But we know that every single person in this world is born in sin and lost without Christ. And they all need a Savior. And that we need to call all of them to repent and believe. And however God does that, we can argue about that once they come in. Or we can argue when we're not dealing with that. But the reason we work together is because we recognize that God saved wretches like us. We don't want any credit for it. We love God. We love our neighbors and we want them to be saved. And we want them to come in and argue those points with us too as we get to have these uh, you know, discussions. <laughs> you want to do it? Well, yeah, just there? a short bit. I just, I'm blessed to have these brothers to work with and I, I really um, I'm bummed when people are divided on this issue. You know, so, uh, it breaks my heart. I would, I would say one simple way to do it is, and I would say to Chris, that you you know immediately when someone's a fellow servant of the king, and you can serve side by side with the fellow servant of the king, and you know it. So the gospel bound, binds, and until the day that we arrive, we're going to have disagreements. And some of the lines I may think are very important, and I do think are very important, and um, I think they're worth sharpening each other's but I'm telling you, when Christ, when Christ is your king, and there's another servant that's proclaiming the goodness of the king with you, that's desiring people to be saved in a way that honors God and not man, probably repentance is the thing that I've learned most from Mark. Um, understanding the spirit of repentance and how that, that changes a person. And um, uh, so anyway, one imperfect servant of the king teaching another imperfect servant of the king about an important topic like repentance. So unity in the faith. I'd say this too. This just kind of throws a different angle into the whole thing, and this is not necessarily even about our doctrinal beliefs, but this is about doctrine itself. And that is that in James chapter two, verse nineteen, it says the devil believes that God is one. You know, he does. Anybody troubles, and it doesn't do him any good. And that's an example in Scripture of how the devil. Uh, basically understands the Bible very well. When he was with Jesus in the wilderness, he used the scripture to try to get Jesus to sin. And the problem is, is there's so many people who know the scripture, but they won't obey the scripture. And that's the issue that was important to Jesus, was obeying the scripture. He said, who are my mother and sister and brothers? And his mother and sister brothers had come and they wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, you know, they were here, his physical flesh and blood was here, and he said, well, who are my brother, sister, mother? And he basically insulted his own family, his own flesh and blood. And he said, who are the ones for my brother, sister, mother? But those who obey God and seek to do his will. And then he also said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he says, not all will cry, Lord, Lord, but in the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. And then many will say, Lord, David, I cast out demons in your name, do many of my miracles, and, and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus says, Depart from me, I never knew you. You work as iniquity. The difference from God's perspective is those who obey him and those who don't. It's not just their theology. And then I believe in America, it's mostly people's theology that we fight over rather than the fact that they're disobedient. We'll fellowship with people who are disobedient because they agree with us rather than fellowship with people who are obedient who may not have perfect doctrine that we think of. I'm not talking about apostate doctrine. I'm talking about people who are within the realm of what it means to be saved. Yeah. And that's why I strive to focus, to have fellowship with people who seek to love Jesus and obey Jesus. Do you say, what does it mean to love him? Does love mean to have perfect doctrine? Paul said, I see through a glass dimly. He didn't know everything. He says, we only know in part. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, read for yourself. We don't know a lot of things. Who, who can who can ask in this room here can tell us when Jesus is going to come back? How many opinions do we have? <laughs> that alone. There's a lot of issues like that. But the issue from God's perspective is, is that who are his children? The ones who obey him. Because if we obey him, that shows we love him. That's Jesus said. In John 15, if you love me, you obey me. If we don't love him, we're not going to obey him. And that's, that's really the critical issue. Yeah, go ahead. So, John, um, you're so smooth with quick comments um, when people are, like, walking through. So at the, at the growers' market today, I noticed it seemed like a lot of people um, profess, they seem to be professing Christians. They didn't want to, they didn't want to track because they're like, I'm good. And so um, I know from Way of the Master, when you're just talking and somebody's standing there one-on-one, -on -one, um, how to kind of dig deeper, ask them a little bit more, like to see, kind of bring some conviction in a kind way. So how would you <coughs> go about doing that? I was asking, well, do you share your faith as they walk through? But how, what are some ways that we can kind of bring some conviction as they're walking through to maybe make them think a little bit more as they walk away, like, well, you know. Yeah. Um, questioning what am I in the faith? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's, it's sadly so common, and, and especially in our valley, we have a lot of professing believers, and it's a, that's a good start thing to start off with. Do you share your faith? And a lot of times they run away, but if you can engage them, you know, ask them. I ask, I like to ask a lot of questions, just my, you know, so, uh, just the Socratic way, getting them to open up. And sometimes it reveals things to themselves. If you ask them, do you share your faith? And, and your typical answer is, oh, I do all the time. Yeah, yeah. I go, oh, what's that look like? Well, um, well, I, I do at church and all my family that are Christians. And you go, what? You know? <laughs> oh, um, so, no, what I meant was, do you talk to people that are unsaved? And they go, uh, well, not really. Or they might say, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. And you, again, you dig deeper and say, so what do you say to them? Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't talk about things like sin or hell or anything like that, like you guys do, the doing it wrong. But I pray for people. I just I pray for them. Oh, so you don't really talk about sin or anything like that. So you start digging down deeper. And, when you, and like that red flag you talked about when, you know, or, uh, you ask somebody if they share the faith when they don't, or they, they run away, if you do get a chance to talk to them, dig a little deeper and, and, and find out, you know, are, are they really a Christian? So I'll, I have a whole sheet of, of questions that I usually ask them. <laughs> it was, pastors don't like them. Uh, but, you know, like, when were you born again? Or have you been born again? And one of my, uh, it's, it's funny, but it's sad too, but like, uh, so Joe, have you been born again? And they go, oh, that's a whole evening's discussion. No, it's, it's not a whole evening's discussion. Have you been born again? You know, and how was? Oh yeah, I have. When was that? Well, I started going to such and such church, or or I got even I got baptized, and that's a common thing. So, but yeah, that's a, there's a lot of good questions, and I, I like to ask. Just dig as deep as you can to find out, because that's a common thing. Like like Brother Mark was saying here, there's a lot of people that profess Christ, but they have no. There's no fruit. You know, like James talks about, you know, uh, I'll show you my faith by my work. So it's a horizontal thing because God knows if we're saved. People don't know. And so if I see that that guy Mason over there, man, he's, he's just rocking. He's out there preaching the gospel all the time, handing out tracts, going to the abortion only. He's, he's, he's doing it. That's exciting to me. I'm like, wow, that's, that's a living faith, a dynamic faith. Um, so so John, but in terms of those questions, so there's a, do you share your faith? Are you born again? That style of question, is there another one that you would recommend using outside of those two? Or um, do, you, do you pretty much stick with those two? Yeah, I, I, I might ask something uh, like, when were you saved? Can you tell me about that? Susan, or whatever, or whatever your name is. Can you tell me about that? And let them share their testimony. And and sadly, what you get is like, well, um, well I, what do you mean? I, I've always loved God. You know, like, that's not in the Bible. 
uh, or I, I got baptized. That's a real common one, baptismal regeneration. So I, I kind of dig down and ask them about to share their testimony with me. And then I ask questions like, so one of my common ones uh, that I ask is, was there ever a day when you said, well, yesterday I was headed to hell. It was, it was terrifying. But today, hallelujah, praise God, I'm headed to heaven because of Jesus Christ and what he did for me. I've been born again. Did you ever have a moment like that? No. Oh, so that's a cause for pause for pause. But if we, if somebody's walking away, I, I think the thing about, well, when did you get born again? And they continue to walk away. Mm -hmm. That might percolate in their brain uh, throughout the day. And then, the, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're kind so, of yeah. planting a seed. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so yeah, just a little, those are, those are good seed questions. Like, do you share your faith? Have you been born again? Or even, you know, I've asked people, are you, are you a Christian? You know, and, and sometimes you just get, yeah, what do you mean? Of course I am. You know? So, uh, yeah, it's hard when they're, they're, they're running away, walking away. Uh, but some of those things are, are good questions asked, like, like uh, Casey said, just to give them something to think about. Yeah, and, and sometimes, uh, like you can, I've seen Ray Comfort do it too, like he'll walk a professing Christian through the good person test. Yeah. And then you get to see, yeah. you get right to the part of it, like, you know, do they believe or, you know, do, do they right. know that Christ paid for sin, you know? Yeah, the, the red flag, you know, yeah. and then and I learned this from Ray Comfort too, is, uh, would you consider yourself to be a good person? You know, <laughs> right. and, they, and, and the professing Christian says, I'm a great person. Yeah. You know, ah, well, no suena correcto. You know, if something doesn't sound right. <laughs> you should say, I'm really a wretch. I'm a filthy, dirty sinner. But praise God, through, through Christ, I'm, I'm perfected. You know, that, that should be the right answer. But, but when they boast it, like, yeah, I'm better than most is one of the classic ones. So that's another question that, that can kind of lead you in a direction like, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm concerned, I want to ask some more questions. Let me tag this real quick, just onto them for the next question about way of the master, because I was thinking of this before you even brought it up. It's good. At sort of Chris, if he's watching still, you want to find, you want to see a ministry that focuses on the gospel and has all kinds of reform, non reform, Calvinist, non Calvinist, whatever you want to call them, working together. They've all been impacted dead heavily by Ray Comfort and Way of the Master. And they all love Way of the Master. And, and people speak highly of them on all sides. Because he focuses on the gospel, he focuses on people calling people to repent, believe, pick up the cross, and follow Christ. So it's great to see that, and that's what's been such a blessing of seeing raised ministry. The people from all sides, the people that want to make divisions about those things, it's about selfishness. I mean, I've seen people that are like, like I said, there's some Calvinists out there that'll say, man, if you're like not preaching to Arminians that they're lost, then they better get off this free will thing. You're a shaky, weak, limp-wristed Calvinist if you are even saved yourself. And but then I've seen these hardcore like Pelagian Street preacher people who have actually done uh, with Kerrigan Skelly and uh, what's the other one? The skinny little guy with the glasses. Um, Jesse. Jesse Morrell. Like Jesse did a whole conference once, and he's an, it was an evangelism conference, and the whole conference was the evils of Calvinism, and the whole conference was on just ripping into Calvinism. I'm like, so you just want to totally alienate everybody that has anything to do with you in evangelism because of this. And I said, look, and I tried to, I talked to him personally on chatting. I'm like, look at how Ray Comfort does it. Look at how way of the magic don't make a focus on this. And you're making this about this. And it's those people that just don't want to do that. It's about calling on people. And a quick quip before Ben asks, one of the best quick answers, fastest guy if you ever heard for people who are just running away is John Peterman. Coward! <laughs> Coward! <laughs> Quip, it's like, oh my, you know, they say something lippy and just keep moving. You're a coward! And I, and I, like, I use that myself sometimes. So I like it. It's like one of the easiest ones. Okay, but, I only used it <laughs> twice today. Twice today. There you go. See, that's, all, that's, that's good. Ben, what was your question here? Um, what's, what's the best way, this is just scatter shot for all your opinions, what's the best way to get a church to start evangelizing <laughs> and, and abolition work to get them to start going and, and when's the point in time to give up? Alright, next question. <laughs> How long do we have here? Wow. 
You know, like Chuck was saying today in his message, the best way that that's going to happen, you go in and you just try to live it. You try to encourage people to get involved. You speak to them. You try to call them to get involved. You keep telling them a bit about the issues and the need. And you may get two or three people, but try to be a voice to your pastors and to the elders and try to encourage them because if by the grace of God they're moved by the heart and they go out, people will follow them. It's like Chuck said, where the under shepherd goes, the sheep follow. And they just do. But if they don't, I... There's going to be differing opinions of whole things of ecclesiology and all kinds of things, when it's time to give up or not. It's so varied. I don't know how we'd even, we'd all have different answers that would be all over. I don't think there's any one we could say for sure. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one before? Yeah, I, I just want to jump in. And, and I, I, I don't never mind. Mind. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I've been saying for years, I discourage people from leaving their church uh, you know, if there's nobody else evangelizing, they've got good doctrine. Hang in there and, and encourage people, even challenge people to come out with you. Uh, invite them. You know, uh, unless unless your leadership in your church is, is saying, hey, quit doing that, quit doing that, beating people over the head with the Bible, they might say, or ramming religion down folks' throat, which is commonly what atheists say. Uh, if they're saying things like that and they're discouraging, yeah, maybe it's time to leave. But if, you, if there are folks that like, yeah, I'd like to go with John, but I, I don't know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared. You know, like I was a little white knuckle the first time I went to uh, Planned Parenthood with these guys years ago. But then I, I lived through it, and I went, <laughs> wow, these guys know what they're doing. And I, I, just, I want, I want to do this. This is, this is important. I would, uh, you know, I probably, I'll answer the question from my perspective. I understand that uh, probably. Uh, I define Christianity as Jesus Christ and following him. I mean, that's God's goal uh, that he's given the church, that we all be conformed to the image of his son before the foundation of the world. That's what God desires for all of us. That we'd all be like Christ. And there's no other example. That's the example God's given us is Jesus. Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. Even though Paul was a great man of God, he pointed to Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are. We have to point to Jesus. He's our example. And Jesus said, uh, like I mentioned about, about uh, you know, he called people to, to deny themselves, pick up the cross, and follow him. And so I see in America that we have leadership of the church, which are to lead the flock by the example. They are example. They have put themselves in a position of being lifted up an example to the body, the fellowship, as what it means to follow Christ. And if they are not following in the footsteps of Christ as far as being willing to go outside the four walls of a church, preach the gospel, and stand up for these children who are being slaughtered by abortion, and the children in the public schools around them that are being indoctrinated in the LGBTQ movement, if they're not willing to do that, I believe they're in sin. And just like we know if a brother or sister's in sin, we go through Matthew 18. And basically, uh, I think at this point in time here in Grants Pass, a lot of the churches need to be confronted because most of the leadership will not stand up for Christ and lead the people outside the church. They will not lead. Where do they lead? Nowhere. Because they want to live a comfortable, easy life and they don't want to offend people because they don't want to lose support. And they're acting more like a hireling rather than like a true shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep and follows Jesus' footstep who laid down his life for us. And so my answer to the question is, is how long do you deal with them? Well, you present the truth to them. If they understand the truth and they don't want to do it, uh, then call them to repentance. If they don't want to repent, bring another witness. Like Matthew 18. And then, you know, like I'm going to start doing, you know, more like we did at Edgewater. Stand out in front of the churches and make a testimony. Now, the reason why I think this is extremely important is because in America, I believe the testimony of the church, and I mean professing church, I'm not saying everybody isn't saved at all. But I'm saying that the testimony has brought so much shame and disgrace to the name of God and to the gospel that the witness that God wants to have to the world, he's not able to do that because we are not representing him rightly. 
And there has to be a division to where people can see the difference between the false gospel and a false church and a true church. The one that loves him and loves their neighbors herself. And if we're not willing to make that division in our relationship, just like the Bible tells us in, in, I mean, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, do not associate with any so-called brother if he happens to be immoral on all these things, if they're involved in these things. We shouldn't associate it. Why? Because it discredits the testimony of our testimony for Christ. And if we're a true Christian, we don't want to associate with people who are discrediting the testimony. That's why a lot of Christians won't go to this church or that church because what we, we, we don't want to, uh, we don't believe those things and that's discrediting Christ. But there's come a point, I believe, in this country, in America, where the true church and the false church need to be shown to the world. And we have to identify. We have to be willing to to make that stand and say, I don't identify with that. I'm standing opposed to that. That is not my Jesus. Because they don't love people the way God says, and they're acting in defiance of what God says marriage and a family should be and all that. I mean, there's so many issues here. But I believe that basically leadership are not exempt from being called out and being exposed, being sinners, and needing to be publicly uh, revealed for who they are. Because they're bringing shame and disgrace to Christ. And uh, that's what we have here in America. I'd say well over probably 90% of the church. Because it's only just a few. I mean, Grants Pass, what do we have? 60, 70 churches down here? Well, how many pastors are really willing to stand up? Most of them are afraid to stand up for Christ. What? You got three, four pastors? Maybe five? At the most. I mean, that's horrible testimony for Christ. In this one city. So... I, I, what I would say briefly is there's a there's a part of that question that's a little more difficult to deal with. Maybe when there's there's right doctrine and there's relationships and that, that. But we know if you're not out there at a mill, if you're not doing biblical evangelism, our first question is, do you even understand the gospel? And most of the time, like we're saying up here, there's going to be confusion on the gospel from the leadership. Regardless of... I, I, we don't even, yeah, we can look at the doctrinal statement, but some of those are still left over right doctrinal statements, but practically it's not being preached anymore. So the question is, is the pastor preaching and believing the gospel? If the answer is no, then I don't think we fellowship. I think that's a black and white, pretty clear, that's not even a brother in Christ kind of concept. That's someone not even preaching the gospel. So that, that'll unfortunately, unfortunately, clarify a lot the churches in a certain category. And outside of that, you have then you can start dealing with, I mean, this Matthew 18, there's relationships as a process. You've got to seek the Spirit, be feel, you know, be real humble, making sure we're, you know, taking this log out of our own eye, that kind of stuff as we move forward with that. But we know, that always happens. We take it back to the gospel. But they're not out there saying don't kill babies because they're not preaching. They, they don't even really believe the gospel, the full gospel that has repentance. Well, think about that statistic. Here's one statistic that's just... Mind-boggling. Fifty states, over three hundred and twenty thousand Protestant churches in the United States. Three hundred and twenty thousand. It's about three hundred and seventy million people. So we've got plenty of room in all the churches for everybody in America to be in, and it's not even close. And seventy, eighty percent say they're Christian. They're being told. And of those three hundred twenty thousand churches, how many of them are out? on the streets, preaching the gospel. So, so it's kind of like what Ryan said. It's like Marx is like getting into like beyond even where, shoot, there's probably most of the churches shouldn't even have anybody in them because sadly they're so apostate. So it's almost like a foregone conclusion that no, you don't even have to worry about calling the pastor because they probably don't even meet the qualifications of being a pastor a great majority of the time. Sadly, but I always tell people it's kind of, and it's our fear of man also, and I, I admit there's fear of man in me in it, but I also see it as I genuinely have this, it's a, it's the compassion, and it's a hopeful look. It's like when I go into worship in church, any any church I've ever been part of, and yet I, and I know all the stats, and I know how little people actually do what Jesus said to do at all. And I know how follower I fail at it so much, but then there's people that just like, it's hard to do anything ever I never see. And you know, just knowing the stats and seeing what people do, and I go in there and I go, man, 
statistically, probably most of these people aren't even Christians. Statistically, by the way things look, the way we try to run things up. But at the same time, I go in there and hope that every single person in there, and I hopefully believe that, man, I sure love these. They, they shake hands and they love you, and you see them. And I sure hope they're all saved, and I, I want to raise hands and believe that, well, they all really are saved, even though probably most of them are. And it's really sad when you face those realities. Mark's used told me this verse before, and I think it's pertinent to think about when you're looking at pastors and leaders. It's Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And there's a thing to submit to rulers and submit to elders and to be a thing. But if you take the command here in Hebrews 13 and go, I've looked at their life. I've looked at the outcome of their life. And there's no way I'm going to imitate that faith. Because this is not worthy. And that goes to back to what Ryan's saying. You look at it and go, you just should probably, there's no reason you should probably be in that church to get to the point of the of Matthew 18. Because you just see from the get-go, that guy ain't even a Christian. Right? It's not even, that's how bad it is. And uh, again, ultimately God's the only judge. But it is, that's why it's so complex. And, and a lot of us were tied into personal commitments to people. We are, we're weak, and it's hard to break away from those things that we're so connected to, especially when you get in a church you've been at 10, 20, 30 years and raised a family, and then you get some doctrinal truth, and you're like, ah, I don't know. And so we, fear of man and watering down gets us in trouble all over the place, I think. Uh, stuff, it's okay. Anybody else got to... Uh, Trevor E., I don't know how to say his last name. The last message mentioned yeah, going to city council. What other peaceful political methods can we organize to do that will directly promote Christ and his kingdom? Is there a need to confront the ideology that being propagated to change America into something more like China? I'm willing, I'm not post mill yet, but I'm seeing a <laughs> desperate, urgent need for gospel and for the truth. Brian's scary, right? It's definitely your, your field here. Abolitionism, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, every... Every city has a council. Every county has a commission, has commissioners. I think that was more directed to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> directed at me? Yes. Yeah, directed at me. My directly at you for this county, for this time, for this place. Oh, for this county, this time, this place. What's your plan going forward? <laughs> oh, I don't know if that was the exact question. <laughs> Sean, um, clarify it for you. So, um, Sean, give a little point. I know he lives in Jackson <laughs> County. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I would say, I would say, if, Maybe time to start addressing them with the city of Medford. But there's, there's some work to be done, Medford. Um, I think it would need to be prayerful. We need to be. We need to look and see what's happened. I didn't realize that um, when we went to Oklahoma and started hearing about the people who had been going to city councils, that that really wasn't as there weren't as a ton of it who were doing it consistently. People were going and having shows, but we went every time. Some of them had these huge resistance happening to them. Like big back council are standing up, turning the back, stuff like that. We got pushback. We didn't we didn't get that kind of thing. And so we were able to consistently do it for a while. So I would say um, I would say in all the cities of Southern Oregon, um, it's, it's cities and counties, we need to we need to go there. Um, we uh, follow following the example of three of the states, there's state representatives that we've spoken to loosely and have continued to speak to. Um, and I, I think as this dust settles, I think there's some work to do at that level. Again, if for no other reason, because we love them, particularly if they're believers, and going, you are in a position right now where it doesn't matter if practically you're going to pass them. No one expects Oregon state legislature to say, abortion is abolished. Nobody like, we're not practically expecting that. When I wasn't practically expecting a city council to stand up and go, done. I will write it, unanimously passed, gone. Close Pan Parenthood. Chief of police, warrant go. Sh arrest those people. You know, I mean, could the sheriff could. We know that. That's part of the thing I've learned from Mason. The sheriff could come in and go, I'm the law of the land. This is done. Get out of here. But there's, there's personal obedience that we call the lo locally elected officials to. And so we've got cities and counties. That that even if it's even if it's not well received, I think there's fruit in it. I didn't realize this. I forget there's people watching those 
those things too. Mm -hmm. I had people eventually reach out to me from Grants Pass, and they go, I really appreciate what you're doing. I'm like, what? I haven't talked to you in like a year. But they, they live stream the city council meetings, and they heard us consistently go. So if you honor God with your, with your speech. Um, so the city of Grants Pass, um, we are dealing with some legal things in terms of the proclamation of um, the freedom of speech and noise ordinance. So I think we're gonna we're gonna see how this plays out, um, and then when that gets settled, uh, I, I would I am gonna continue conversation with some state representatives, um, and um, yeah, that's that's the main one. All of those things. I mean, the big question. You know, he's talking about Postville getting into the whole thing. Like, how do we change this country? It's full of everything, and how do you bring it? The thing is, it's like obviously. Without the grace of God to do mighty work, nothing's going to get better. I mean, we are in we are in fastly de depreciating territory, and it doesn't matter what eschatology you hold to. You're all every one of them holds an opening for our whole country to go into the toilet. You know, not one of them thinks that there's we're sacrosanct and can't fall. Um, and I think that our only hope for is a nationwide revival. Um, of the gospel and massive repentance greater than either of the first two great awakenings. I mean, it would have to be such a widespread change that would have any help of saving our nation as America, as we say. And the question is, what is it, is it worth it? Anyway, well, of course not. It's all grace that we provide at all. So, I mean, we're not worth saving. We're worth Billy Graham, you know, was his wife, Ruth, you know, they pass around whoever said it, you know, but if, if God doesn't judge America, then, you know, he always saw him in the war and apology, you know, kind of the saying, you know, people for, I mean, we're, we're, we're due. So, um, is there any hope? There might be, but it's going to be based in the gospel. It's going to be based in God and his grace giving a sweeping change, or the other way was he will sovereignly rule that the country needs to go down and he'll rebuild from the flames from pocket revolutions and bloodshed and destruction all over, or some mix probably of those two. Um, and it could be crazy Hollywood post-apocalyptic type of stuff. Um, well, and on that note, and I, and I knew what we were doing. We were asking the city council of Grants Pass to do something the pastors of Grants Pass weren't willing to do. Exactly. And there, I mean, that was moments. Well, I mean, we were, we were broken over that. And we, we knew what was happening, and we were trying. And so, you know, to answer Trevor's question specifically, Trevor, you know a pastor? Go talk to him. Yeah. Get the pastors. Get in, get into a pastor conference. If you can show up with 20 pastors to a city council meeting, and they're like, no, this needs to happen today, yeah. and I'm, I'm willing to stand here and say it. I think the narrative is completely different. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, it's. I, I do believe God could have raised up a city councilor to do it and delivered us, because none of us deserve it. Anyway, and led us into repentance and the sin for the sake of the gospel. But we were asking elected city councilors politically to do something that the pastors of Grants Pass were not willing to do, and that that is, does not bode well for the gospel, for the for the credibility of the you know the Mark was saying credibility of the gospel and the condition of the heart of the church. So anything I do moving forward, even though there's some other political things to focus on, it's all with the body of Christ and the pastors. Um, which not all of them get super happy with us these days. But, you know. I, would, I would say this too, is that we're fighting a battle on different levels. The political is only one level. And ultimately, um, um, I think the, the ultimate level we need to realize is a spiritual one. And if you lose the uh, any army that goes to battle, the first thing they have to do is they have to win the air. The, the army that wins has the air superiority already will have the ground under their control. If they do not win the air battle, they're going to fight a losing battle if the enemy has the air and if they're just there fighting on land. And what I'm saying is the political is a land battle. The spiritual is the air battle. And I believe that the reason why we're not effective politically is because we haven't won the air battle, and that is... I believe the church's responsibility to repent. The example of Joshua chapter 7 is a key chapter to understanding spiritual warfare. 
And in that chapter, it was when uh, Joshua and the children of Israel, they had just taken over Jericho. They had just come into the promised land, and God was giving them victory. God had promised them they, could, they would, everywhere the sole of their foot had, would, would go, that they God had given that land, and, and as he promised Abraham. But when they took over Jericho, they took some of the things under the ban, which Achan did. And that caused uh, Joshua and the children of Israel not to be able to defeat Ai, which is a small city, I think, I can't remember, I think it was about 11,000 people. And here you had uh, uh, over 2 million people, probably Israelites, who had come out of Egypt, and they could have well took them over. So they sent a small group up there, and they were defeated. And God told Joshua that you are not going to be able to stand for your enemies. Your enemies will destroy you because I am not with you because you have sin in the camp. And I believe that sin is in the camp of the church. And until the church repents, we're not going to win that battle. We're not going to win the air battle. We're going to lose the political battle. We've already lost it. We lost it a long time ago. Back in 2015, when the homosexuals got gay marriage passed, they only had 2% of the population. There's over... Now there's 65%, it used to be more percent of the population of the United States claim to be Christian. How could they with 2%? Why? Because God is not with his church because the church, and when I'm saying church, I don't mean the real church, I mean the professing church, okay? Don't misunderstand me. But God is was not, and they, just as he was not with Israel, that was his chosen people. He says, I will not be with you. Your enemies will destroy you because you will not repent. And until you repent, you have no victory. You, they will chase you. You will not chase them. See, if you're right with God, one can chase a thousand. But if you're wrong with God, one of them can chase a thousand of you. That's what's happening in America. We have a small minority of the wicked, and they are chasing, the church is running. Because we're not fighting the battle right because we will not humble ourselves and repent. The key to victory is that we need to repent. And until the church repents, we're headed for destruction. Now, as far as what we should do politically and all that kind of stuff, we still need to do what is right. Even though it may mean suicide, you know, as far as we're going to die. I mean, I, that's one thing that's very much gripped my soul. I know that I'm picking up the cross, following Christ. I'm going to die. I'm going, not only just because I'm a human and we all die, but I know I'm headed for the cross. I'm headed for death. And we need to have that attitude. That's what Jesus told his disciples to have. All of them died. John was only boiled alive in oil out of the twelve. But they all were martyred. And in the first 300 years of the Christian church, there was 10 persecutions by Rome. The Christians were fed to the lions. There were there were torches on Nero's porch, lit a flame. But they had the light of God's love, and the Roman Empire was overcome by the obedience of God's people. And just as the the they overcame the Roman Empire by obedience, I believe that the American Empire will be destroyed by the disobedience of the church. It's our choice. Whether we obey or not, whether this country goes down or not. To me, the issue is obedience. We can pray, we can fast, we can bind the devil and pray a hedge of protection. It is useless if we don't repent. Repentance is the key to this nation right now, and that is in the church's hands. God has blessed this nation because of the church, and he will judge this nation because of the church. Let me throw a real quick end on that. This is something I heard someone talk about today. We, we want quick solutions. And our compromise in this country, in our politics, and we try to mix the faith with politics. And, and I, and it's just, people will take something, and I heard it today from somebody, and we will take the promises that God gave in the world, in, in the Bible, to those who bless Israel. Bless Israel, I'll bless you. You curse Israel, I'll curse you. And I've heard it said, you'll hear people, well, we've got to support Trump, or we've got to support the Republican, or whoever it is, because Israel's our ally. And if we're, as long as we're good with Israel, they like think that's like the stamp, that if we're cool with Israel, we're their ally, well, God's going to keep blessing our country. 
Israel, and you can get a big, that's, that's eschatology, why it matters, is big, 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 people get looking like, well, that's all we really need to keep doing. As long as we can get us a Republican, they'll back Israel, we're good. We'll keep our color TVs and our air conditioning, and, you know, this is good to mess, but we'll be good to go. Kind of the same thing you see with, well, we got to repent that Republicans, we got to get the Supreme Court justices to overturn Roe v. Wade. It's like, we just gotta, so we got to take all the garbage with the with the good because we've got to do what little we can with the least amount of effort we possibly can because, like Mark said, we're unwilling to repent. We're unwilling to say, no more compromise. Give me a righteous candidate or give me none. I'll either stand for one who will do right, and I'll call him to do it, or I won't. And I don't care. I literally don't care. Not to say I don't care like I don't prefer, but I don't care if Joe Biden wins the presidency, if it came down to my Kevin Costner vote to not vote for Donald Trump. I'll say that personally for anybody to watch it. Because I'm not going to compromise on what I've been convicted of, of supporting a baby murderer that Donald Trump is. And he's just as bad as the others in the fact that he supports it in some cases, and I won't make excuses for it. This state, because of our lack of repentance, because of the, st the state has come this bad, because Christians have compromised so long, so bad, that we have come to the point where we don't care what you believe what you do, as long as you have an R in front of your name, you will get our vote. And that is, I know it for a fact, because 800,000 Oregonians, the mass majority, I'm sure, professing Christians, voted for the Republican candidate of governor, uh, what's his name, New Bueller, pro-abortion, pro-gay marriage, but he had an R in front of his name. So the conundrum that you, I used to throw at people, well, who would you vote for the lesser two evils if you're voting for Hitler or Mussolini? They go, well, that's ridiculous. We're never gonna. No, that's what Oregon was this time. And there were Christians bending over backwards to defend that wickedness. So I've seen it in our state, leading the way, a liberal, godless, hateful slide, professing Christians that we worship in church with, bending over backwards to support that wicked a candidate. So, Donald Trump, who not quite as bad as Bueller in that, at least with that those statements, but trust me, if New Bueller ran for president with an R in his name, the mass majority of Christians would vote for him because the mass majority would do it here. So as long as we continue to say, eh, we get the best we can, we will continue to slide into the toilet of faster and faster until we're destroyed. That's why the spiritual is the preemptive to the physical. We're not going to win anything with the government. We're not going to gain anything. All we're doing right now is putting somewhat of a break on the slide into destruction. And eventually God will just let that completely fall off, wheels fall off, and while we go in with our complacency. Because we'd rather be as comfortable as we can as we slide into the pit. So, and, I, and I, so, I know I take off a lot of people like that, but I... The compromise is killing us, and until we stop that, and that's why abolitionism is the hardest pill to swallow. That's what makes the most pro-lifers upset with people, is because we say no compromise, immediate and uncompromising, and we don't mean it just with that. We mean it with everything. It's, you got someone who's openly in sin. We clearly show it in scripture. Abortion is such an easy one to deal with, because it's like, oh yeah, you shall not murder. Love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty much Christianity 101. You know, we can't get that right. So if we're that putrid in our care for that which is so simple, why in the world is God going to bless this country? Why in the world is he going to continue to bless us? Just because, well, we support Israel, or we're going to vote for a Supreme Court justice. No. That's the putrid state of American evangelical. And it needs to, there should be brokenhearted repentance over it. We need to grow. And I'll say, like my, myself, more. Like Paul Washer says, don't tell me when you once repented. Tell me, what are you doing now that is living your life in repentance today? And uh, I need it. We all need it. I think that's where the mess is with this whole country. I know we're past 810. We're in 8, so 
Maybe Jess you want to say something quick before we close things <laughs> up here. You asking these four guys for something? Yeah, I know. Just, I, know I know people also want to get home and get this place goes up for people too. But, but I officially tick enough people off. But uh, right there. <laughs> I think it pretty much wraps up the messages that we had today. Mm -hmm. Chuck, um, the Shepherd's Conference with 5,000 pastors. You know, how many of those guys repented after hearing that message from Paul Washer? Yeah. Um, the message from Mark saying that our churches need to repent. And what are we going to do about it? Or are we just going to continue to do the same things with a handful of people? Or are we going to go out on the streets and call all men at all places at all times to repent? And the evidence of their repentance is going to be the changes, the more morality changes, not only in our society, but in our laws and the way we go about business. That's the evidence. That's the fruit of every man coming to repentance and trusting in Jesus Christ. Amen. Bible. We're bringing it. And I know they, the, the first judgment begins at the house of God. was mentioned right. several times today. Yeah. So, I mean, like, church repent, you know, is that biblical? That's the, that's the big question. Yeah. So don't ask that question now while we're trying to go to the He just said something in the whole debate right here, man. <laughs> you dirty rat scoundrel. All right. Purple bus and ten. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for everybody that's been part of this conference. Thank you, Lord, for sending so many people to bless one another, bless me. I pray, Lord, that you would move through us, you would use us. Let this prayer, let this time, let it be a spark, Lord. There's been great revivals that have happened because of your grace, because one man said, oh, Lord, bring revival. Oh, Lord, forgive us. And it's a simple prayer of one man and something sparks off. And, Lord, we know that it has to be a move by your spirit. We know we can't bring this about. Like Mark said, we can't pray ourselves, fast ourselves, hedge ourselves in. We have to plead with God, but then we have to do what your word tells us to do. We have to lead in repentance. We have to call others to repentance. We need to walk in repentance, and we'll only do that by the power of the Spirit, not the flesh. So fill us with your Spirit. Guide us and strengthen us in your word, and use us for your glory in this day, and bring that revival for your glory. We ask that, Lord. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Anybody? Yeah. Clean up. 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 Clean up.